fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Today we're covering true crime and we'll be covering a, a, a really surprising story uh, from an excellent book. Uh, I've just been listening to. It's called The Lazarus Files, and it's a cold case investigation. came out in April of this year, and uh, joining me today is the author of the book, researcher, uh, Matthew McGough. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Now, Matt, now how did you get into doing this? This is a, a really complex interesting case cold case that's lasted for years um what got you into this case how did you find it well my, my journey uh investigating this uh this cold case began about 10 years ago uh the uh the person who committed the murder was an LAPD detective named Stephanie Lazarus and it was a cold case in that uh she was not arrested until 2009, but the crime occurred in uh, February of 1986, about 23 years earlier. And it was actually a coincidental meeting that I had with uh, Lazarus, Stephanie Lazarus, the uh, the guilty party, about a year before she was arrested that that uh, sparked my interest in the case. So so I, I actually interviewed her about her, uh, uh, about art theft which was the, uh, her last detective assignment before she was arrested, uh, thinking that I was going to write a book about art theft, and then it was uh, about a year after our initial conversation that she was arrested for murder. So that really uh, obviously threw me for a loop, uh, that this uh, veteran female LAPD detective who I sat down with and talked with about art and uh, art theft, uh, you know, was uh, suddenly accused of having committed a horrific murder almost a quarter century earlier. So uh, obviously had a lot of questions, and that's what set me down this road that led to uh, uh, writing this book. So, so when you um, started going through and getting the information and meeting people and writing the book and, and, and all that, um, how did you find um, the reaction of of people that were close to the case? Well, it's been an ongoing process. Uh, like I said, you know, uh, I really sort of fell down the rabbit hole uh, in June 2009, which was when Stephanie was arrested, and uh, started going down to court uh, for uh, her arraignment and subsequent uh Court, court proceedings. She she went to trial in 2012, so it was about a three-year period uh, that the case was sort of winding its way through court, and it was through that experience going to court uh, that I got to know many of the people who uh, had been affected by this tragedy, uh, and uh, you know, most most significantly, the the family of the victim, uh, Sherry Rasmussen, uh, her parents. Uh, also attended all of the court hearings uh, because Stephanie was a LAPD officer. Uh, there was um, quite a, you know, there was it was a high high profile, high priority case for the LAPD uh, given given the circumstances of the crime. And so I also got to know um, a lot of law enforcement personnel, uh, the detectives who were assigned to the case, detectives who worked in the LAPD's cold case uh, cold case homicide unit. Uh, and others, and so it was more of a process than uh, um, sort of all, all the information coming out at at one time. But it was it was a combination of 
following the court court case very very closely and then getting to know uh people who were actually in the story uh that i that i developed all the information that eventually ended up in the book so when you met her and you were talking with her uh what did you think of her like would it would was it a real surprise to find out that she was involved in a murder or were you sort of um did what kind of feeling did you get about her no i it was completely shocked uh, uh she was very cordial um uh stephanie had a good reputation uh a, as a uh you know as a detective i mean it, it's sort of surprising uh looking back uh why someone who was harboring a secret like that literally having committed a murder uh 20 some years earlier and continuing to work as a police officer the entire entire time uh you know why she would have granted an interview with with a journalist like myself uh but but she did uh it was a cordial conversation uh in my memory the most you know uh, vivid thing about it is again that i i interviewed her inside lapd headquarters um so i certainly you know was not on the lookout for uh homicide suspects uh when i was sitting sitting across from her and her partner uh, the interview itself wasn't all that memorable, uh, um, but you know it was an interesting thing to uh, to talk with a a detective um, about her work. Like I said, in, inside police headquarters. So uh, it, it was about a year later when the news broke that she had been arrested that uh, suddenly cast that earlier conversation in a in a very different light. Now she still denies doing it, right? Like she's not, she hasn't admitted to it. No, she's never taken responsibility uh, for the crime. Uh, she did not testify uh, during her trial. Uh, she did not make any uh, statement at all, uh, let alone any express any any remorse or anything uh, prior to her sentencing. So, in fact, Stephanie has made no no public statements uh, at all. Um, since the day that she was arrested in June 2009. And I, I reached out to her uh, in prison a couple of times, uh, requesting interviews uh, prior, uh, you know, while, you know, before I finished the book. Um, she, she did not respond, which obviously is her, her prerogative. Um, but there was quite a, quite a lot of information that came in uh, about her during the trial, and I was able to uh, interview uh, many of her former colleagues, uh, friends, and family members. Uh, so, you know, yeah. uh, that's how I was able to fill in as, as much as I could about her um, perspective. Now, now, um, how how was that perceived by her family? Did it, now did her friends and colleagues, people that worked with her in the police department? And uh, any family or anything like that now they did, did they support her and believe she was innocent, or were they kind of not sure, or they were totally a, a thought she did it? Well, you know, there's there's ten thousand you know officers on the LAPD, so it's very hard, obviously, to to generalize in terms of what everyone uh, believed. But um, you know, certainly. Uh, I would say for the vast majority of, um, you know, the police officers, as, as the evidence came out, there, there, you know, there was uh, quite a lot of uh, circumstantial and also direct evidence that, that Stephanie had, had committed the murder. Um, uh, she had a motive. Uh, there was DNA, her DNA that was at the crime scene. Uh, so I think um, for most people uh, that, that evidence removed any any doubt that they had about whether or not this might have been uh, a mistake uh, that she that she she would have been uh, call, you know called to answer for committing this crime. You know, with her family, I think it's a little bit more complicated. Um, Stephanie now is divorced, but at the time of her arrest, she was married to a fellow LAPD officer, um, a fellow LAPD detective. Uh, he he attended most of her trial, and you know their marriage did not end until after she was convicted. So I do think for some of her family members, it was harder to accept uh, 
that that she may in fact have done this um and you know again it it, it this this whole story unfolded over time so i i, I would say probably at the time that she was arrested there were, um you know there were there were a lot of doubts and then over the course of the criminal case and more evidence is, is introduced uh, i think i think a lot of those doubts uh, fell away for for a lot of people but to this day uh as i said she she hasn't uh admitted her guilt and uh you know it, it it's i think a difficult situation for her family member stephanie was probably the most uh accomplished uh member of her family in terms of being uh a longtime police detective and so there's there's quite a big uh distance between um where she was the day before she was arrested and how she was perceived uh within her family and then uh for that all to come crashing down you know in the span of 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 one morning when she was arrested i think um probably created a lot of co uh cognitive dissonance for uh you know people who were close to her yeah i just i just wonder if um do you think she's ever committed other crimes uh, since the 1986 murder until she was arrested? That's a long period. So do you think um, she was involved in other crimes, or this was just kind of... A, yeah, I don't... Yeah, I did not find any evidence of anything uh, close to... You know, I don't think that she's hiding another murder. Um, didn't find any evidence or anything to, to, to suggest that. Um, but obviously, you know, this is, this is the most serious, uh, crime that someone can, can commit. So, uh, um, yeah. you know, it, it's not as if, uh, you know, she would need a second crime, uh, for it to, um, you know, be, be of concern. But no, I mean, generally, I think her career as a, as a officer and as a detective was on some, level fairly unremarkable um in that she uh you know i i i don't think she was you know like i don't think uh she, she faced uh you know like her record wasn't littered with other disciplinary infractions or or things like that uh you know the more interesting uh i mean let alone crimes uh, in, in terms of her record as an officer, uh, for me, the more interesting aspect of, of, of her career, rather than uh, you know things that she, you know, rules that she may have broken or any other crimes that she may have committed, is is just how uh, how many different sensitive assignments she worked as a police officer. She made detective. She later worked in internal affairs. She worked performing background checks of. Uh, civilian applicants to the LAPD. Uh, she worked homicide uh, at Van Nuys Homicide, where the case, the murder that she had committed, was still an open case. Uh, and uh, several other assignments before she, you know, eventually reached the art that detail, which is which is how I met her. Um, hmm. Now, did you think that? Um at the time of the murder, um, was there any chance that she would be suspected? Yeah, she certainly was was suspected by um, several of the family members and friends of of Sherry Rasmussen. Uh, uh, Stephanie was romantically involved with the husband of the victim, uh, Sherry. Uh, Sherry's husband, John, had been a college classmate of Stephanie at UCLA, and their relationship was somewhere between uh, a friendship and a romantic relationship, sort of an on-and-off-again relationship is how it's been described. Uh, and that continued from college, uh, which was in the late 70s, early 80s, until about 1984, which was when John met uh, Sherry Rasmussen, uh, who would become his wife and it was that dynamic of a love triangle uh that ultimately precipitated the murder so were they still 
um, seeing each other or having an affair, as people would call it, after John got married? Uh, yeah, again, the uh, listeners can, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, well, they can find more details and dates uh, about this within the book. But, yeah, there, there are, you know, as more details came out during the trial, it, it became apparent that uh, the romantic relationship between John and Stephanie uh, did not have a clean break, uh, and that, in fact, uh, John and Stephanie had gotten together uh, uh, during his engagement to Sherry, uh, and then, in fact, se- uh, several years after the murder committed, now, John was told by the detectives back in 86 that Stephanie had been investigated and eliminated as a suspect. So, according to him, he he believed that uh, she had nothing to do with Sherry's murder. Um, but nevertheless, uh, John and Stephanie reconnected in the early 90s and resumed their relationship at that time. So, uh, that's sort of a difficult thing to uh, wrap your head around, that he... Um, in fact, had sex with his wife's killer unwittingly uh, in terms of not knowing that she had committed that horrific crime um, several years after the murder. So so you think uh, that John is pretty clear he wasn't involved or he didn't know about it? Well, John was, again, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of ambiguity yeah. in the story and... Uh, there's lots of points in the story where different people are saying different things and it's hard, if not impossible to arbitrate, um, a hundred percent who is telling the truth and who's not, uh, my strategy for, for dealing with that was to interview as many people, uh, as I could and to present the information as objectively as is possible. Everything in the book is based on either interviews I conducted myself or, sworn testimony that was given on the witness stand or uh, interviews or statements that were given to the LAPD. So I tried to be very careful with my sourcing and present where I was getting uh, the information uh, from. Um, but yeah, John was, uh, was, was quite clear on the witness stand and in various interviews he gave with the police that uh, he provided Stephanie's name and the fact that she was a police officer to the detectives investigating the murder the day after uh, Sherry was killed. So, what do you think when you when you were doing the research and 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 involved in writing the book? What do you what was the biggest surprise or the biggest shock to you um, during that process? Well. The day Stephanie was arrested was a pretty big shock, obviously, just because, uh, again, I had met uh, this woman, had a cordial conversation with her, lasted more than an hour, exchanged business cards, uh, and then to find out that uh, she was stood accused of committing a horrific murder uh, so many years earlier, and... Uh, had not only possibly gotten away with it, but had been a police officer uh, that entire time. Uh, th- th- I would that would probably rank as as the biggest shock uh, um, throughout this uh, experience of researching and writing this book. But uh, there were many others, and it's been sort of a journey and uh, process of learning and discovering more all the way along. So I, there were a lot of uh, things that I didn't know about how uh, cold cases are investigated, uh, the history of the LAPD's cold case unit, how it is that different cold cases are prioritized, how this case was uh, solved, and uh, so many different wrinkles, um, policies, procedures, um, different perspectives of people in the story. I mean, it, it's there's uh, the surprises are. are are um they're endless you know <laughs> endless yeah and and continuing i feel like i even since the book has been out over the last few weeks i've been hearing from quite a few people who uh either worked with stephanie over the years or um have their own uh perspectives or experiences that they've shared and that that's new information to me um 
maybe if I get to revise the book when there's uh, a paperback edition, I'll be able to uh, um, fold, fold some of that new info in. But yeah, I mean, it's sort of crazy even 10 years into uh, digging into this story. I, I'm still still learning new uh, new details. It feels like almost every day. Yeah. So do we know why why she committed this crime? I mean, if, if she's denying it and not admitting it, you're not getting it from her. And I guess the obvious thing would be because uh, John had married this Sherry Rasmussen. So, I mean, that would be kind of the guesswork I would have. Do you think that's that's why she did this? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear uh, what what the interpersonal dynamics were leading up to the murder, uh, in that it was a love triangle and that Stephanie had a broken heart. Uh, one of the, the pieces of evidence that came in during the trial, uh, which I, I quote from quite a bit in the book, is uh, a diary that Stephanie actually kept uh, back in the uh, mid-1980s. Uh, at the time the murder was committed, uh, Stephanie was a uh, LAPD patrol officer. She had joined the LAPD in 1983, so had about three years on the job. And she had a practice of keeping a uh, a diary uh, of her activities on duty. Uh, whenever she worked, uh, she uh, sort of wrote down a, a narrative of, who her partner was, what she had done on duty that day. So I had a pretty remarkable record of um, what she had been up to on the job and in her own voice um, from about 12 to 18 months prior to the murder, uh, running uh, through the day of the murder and then about six months afterwards. So uh, that information sort of, sort of uh, helped make clear the degree to which uh, Stephanie felt uh, left behind, um, heartbroken um, by the fact that John had uh, met someone else and had decided to marry her. And I think that was uh, something that, that built inside of uh, Stephanie, um, you know, right up, right up until the day of the murder. And uh, it's clear, you know, also other conversations that Stephanie had with, with friends where she she uh, confessed her heartbreak to them that, uh, you know, that there not only was there direct evidence, but, you know, there was quite a bit of circumstantial evidence uh, in terms of her motives to, to support why why she um, did this. Well, you know, you, you mentioned how, okay, so, you know, it's a triangle relationship, and uh, she was heartbroken that John had married Sherry, and um, so... In essence, that's what, that's what we're kind of suggesting is why she killed Sherry. And then you say that the two of them, John and uh, Stephanie, hooked back up after the, after the murder was committed, uh, like down the road. Um, did John and, and Stephanie end up married, or did they end up together then? Like, or if not, how come? Well, they, no, they, they, they never married. And like I said, uh, the relationship is a bit ambiguous. Uh, you know, it's a phrase that people use today that say that, you know, somebody's friends with benefits. I don't know if that was, uh, that, uh, phrase had been coined yet at, at the time these, these events were unfolding in the 1980s, but it seems like, uh, it was sort of, uh, a very close friendship that had a um, sexual component uh, that, you know, sort of um, yeah. ran through the relationship. But, it, but you know, they, they, they were never uh, boyfriend-girlfriend, or at least John never considered them boyfriend-girlfriend. Uh, friends of theirs did not see them as boyfriend-girlfriend. But for many years in their, you know, dur during the college years and, and the years after college, uh, they were for stretches sort of inseparable and, and best friends and, and that continued, uh, until John met Sherry. And then after her murder, uh, according to John, uh, this is what he said on the witness stand, uh, they, they were not in contact for some time. He had been told by the detectives that Stephanie was not involved in the murder. And so I think, uh, again, according to John, that's what, um, he believed to be true 
And then it was a couple years after that that they uh, reconnected. John admitted on the witness stand that uh, the romantic relationship resumed in the early 90s. That's probably five or six years after the murder. And then a year or two after that, uh, coincidentally, uh, both John and Stephanie met other people who, who they would eventually marry. So, so by the mid nineties, Stephanie is, is married to, uh, um, the fellow police officer, uh, who she stayed with, um, through the end of her arrest. And John had also, uh, remarried, um, to a woman with whom he started a family and, uh, remains married to today. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, yeah, I see that, but I just, I just find that strange because in her mind, if she actually went out and killed this Sherry because she felt, you know, um, Sherry was taking John away from her, and um, she wanted more of him or wanted to be around him more, you would think after the murder she would work at getting back together with him. Yeah, again, it, it is. I would agree with you. It is strange, and and it's hard to know exactly what is what was going on inside that relationship. Uh, what John um, may have suspected but uh, was unwilling to admit, maybe even to himself. Um, uh, there were certainly a lot of people around Sherry, particularly her parents and her girlfriends, uh, to whom she had confided uh, a series of troubling incidents involving John's ex-girlfriend. Uh, Sherry felt like she was being uh, uh, followed uh, Stephanie once came to Sherry's workplace and confronted her in her office, said something like, uh, if I can't have John, no one, um, no one can. And, uh, uh, Sherry felt, I think, quite, uh, uh, you know, somewhere on the spectrum between, uh, you know, threatened, uh, harassed, uh, annoyed, uh, by this ex-girlfriend of John enough that she told, uh, her parents and close girlfriends about it um, prior prior to her murder, um, and quite a bit of that information was communicated to the detectives investigating the case, but um, none of that information was documented in the police records, and uh, it again uh, th these are things that ended up having. Uh, um, you know, the, the the passage of time only only compounded the mistakes that were made early early in the investigation. What do you hope people get out of the book? Like, what what do you want? Is there a story that you want them to to get, or um, some sort of meaning? Um, what what would be your your thought on what? Well, I guess the reason that it it what sustained me the entire time I was working on it because again I, I didn't know what I was in for when I started working on this. If you go back to my explanation of how this all started, I sat down with with this uh, police detective and interviewed her about art theft, and then a year later, I found out that she had been arrested for murder. So that, that was a pretty good hook uh, um, and a pretty interesting story to to get into it. Uh, what I what I didn't realize at the beginning and what became more important to me over time was understanding uh, how the police department works, uh, how these cases are investigated, and uh, where the mistakes may have been made in this case. I mean, I think it's you don't get more more serious crime uh, than murder. The fact that a police officer committed a murder, got away with it for so many years, that's obviously a really grave um, failure institutionally on the part of of the LAPD. And uh, when Stephanie was arrested, the parents of the victim, uh, Nels and Loretta Rasmussen, uh, they gave a press conference where they uh, intimated that uh, although they were happy with the LAPD of 2009 and the job they had done bringing Stephanie to justice, they had very serious uh, questions and concerns about what had been done in 1986 and whether there had been uh, a cover-up uh, based on Stephanie's status as a police officer and the information that had been provided to the detectives back in 86, and the family felt as though the investigation may have been steered away from Stephanie because she was a police officer. And uh, the LAPD uh, promised an investigation into what went wrong, but uh, 
as time passed. And again, I was sort of investigating what had happened myself uh, at the same time that uh, uh, the LAPD had claimed to be doing its own investigation. But pretty much none of the people who I spoke with involved in the case had been contacted by the LAPD. And after a few years, when Stephanie was convicted, the LAPD announced that their investigation had found no evidence of a cover-up. But uh, I questioned how the department could know that when they hadn't interviewed anyone, apparently. Because, again, if if they had been uh, doing a thorough investigation of what went wrong, I would have expected that we would have been interviewing the same people. Instead, it seemed as if I was the only one who was interviewing anyone. Um, even while the department was was claiming publicly that uh, you know the the Rasmussen's accusation had been investigated and uh, you know the department had you know determined that there was no intentional cover up. So again, for for there to be a failure as serious as uh, missing a murderer in their midst for more than twenty years, especially when you know the family is um, claiming that that they identified. Uh, the killer to the detective directly the day after the murder in 1986. Um, you know, that, that, sh- that should not happen. Uh, and it should not be. And if you're going to have a, an institutional failure as grave as this one, I think it's incumbent on the institution to, uh, draw some lessons, uh, identify what the mistakes were, um, you know, so that nothing like this could ever happen again. So I think that desire for, you know, the full truth and um, accountability, I think accountability is a goal that, again, it's, it's not in my control. Uh, it, it, it would, that has to come from inside the LAPD. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was, uh, it was clear that, uh, you know, th- this was a serious failure, and I wanted to do as, as as thorough an investigation as I was capable of to get the facts on the table and uh, hopefully um, set up the conditions such that something like this is is less likely to happen um, hmm. in the future ever again. So, so you're thinking that the actual 1986 investigation was more of a failure than a cover up. Well, you know, I sort of avoid uh, uh, labels right. in the book. I mean, I wanted yeah. to sort of show, not tell, and, uh, again, try to present information objectively uh, rather than judgmentally. Uh, um, so I don't, you know, you won't find uh, sort of a sentence summing up uh, this was a cover-up or not a cover-up, Um Again, uh, what I uh, learned and, and sort of focused on uh, was, you know, the policies and procedures that d- detectives uh, follow and are supposed to follow when they investigate a homicide. There's obviously uh, a lot of cases, uh, a lot of different detectives, uh, personal styles, writing styles. There's so many variables uh, for any homicide case uh, that's being worked. but. There are best practices that have developed over the years, and what became clear to me as I dug deeper into this case was that uh, some of the the biggest missed opportunities, uh, chances where the case could have been uh, resolved much sooner than it was, uh, those sort sort of lined up with uh, the times that uh, you know policies and procedures were not followed, and so it was interesting to me to. uh, sort of see what the, you know, uh, what the risks and dangers are of disregarding, you know, uh, standard policies and procedures, um, and what can go wrong as a result of that, um, you know, years years down the road. So yeah, I, I would say a failure without question. I mean, Stephanie was guilty of murder, and um, it. You know, did not get uh, arrested for 23 years after the murder and worked as a cop that whole time. I think that, you know, by anyone's measure would be a pretty serious institutional um, failure in terms of whether there was a cover-up. Uh, again, I think there's 
uh, evidence of uh, avoidance. You know, I, I think again, previously, I before I started digging into this, I I would have, you know, I'm not sure what I would have looked for as as like the hallmark or conclusive proof that uh, something had been covered up. Uh, over the course of investigating this, I it's become apparent to me that, uh, you know, sometimes what people call a cover-up can be evidence, you know, there's like a red flag, something that should be investigated that is uh, something's obviously wrong. But in, instead of uh, it being investigated, there's like, you know, it's, it's the lack of action. Uh, it's when something calls out for action and nothing happens uh, uh, that is sort of troubling and insidious. Uh, so, it, it, you know, a cover-up is not necessarily a active act. It can be uh, um, looking away when there's something that, that seems like it, it should have uh, warranted uh, action. Hmm. Now, now she got convicted eventually. Uh, is that right? Yes, Stephanie was convicted of first degree murder, so she's now serving a sentence of twenty seven years to life. And um, is she appealing that, or is that? Yeah, she's filed numerous appeals, uh, all of which have been denied to date. Um, you know, again, obviously, it's her right; she can appeal it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, but. You know, uh, based on my experience, um, you know, attending the trial and observing all the evidence and testimony, I, I don't think she's a very good, good candidate for appeal. Um, but obviously, she she has the right to appeal, and to this day, she she's never uh, um, taken any sort of responsibility or uh, expressed remorse, and um, you know, to be a good candidate for uh, for parole. Um, you know, you would have to uh, take responsibility. So, yeah. uh, as things stand today, I think sh- I think she'll she'll be in prison for a while. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's going to be a long long while, probably. Um, yeah, I, I just I just wonder. It, it must be just as tough for a female uh, police officer in prison as a male. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Again, I, 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 I really hope to interview Stephanie for the book, um, and never got that, app, uh, never got that opportunity. So yeah, I have my own questions about what it's like for her, um, inside. Um, anecdotally, I heard that she, uh, declined any sort of, uh, um, you know, I think there, there, there can be like, uh, you know, high risk. Uh, inmates can be segregated uh, for their protection or for other reasons um, from others. Uh, but I, I, I heard anecdotally that Stephanie declined uh, declined that. So uh, she's apparently in with the general population, uh, which is uh, apparently something that she she chose. Uh, but you know, there's only a handful of women's prisons in California. I think three total. Uh, so it's a smaller number of prisons. Um, uh, she's moved around a few times. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I know about that. Hmm. During the trial, um, how did she appear? Like, was she, um, aggressive? I mean, I know she didn't testify, but when she was sitting with her counsel and stuff during the trial. Yeah, not aggressive. No. No, very, I would say stone-faced is the... You know the adjective I would use. Uh, she only really uh, smiled uh, when she would enter and leave the courtroom. She would look towards her family members. Her her mom, her brother attended much of the trial. Her husband at that time. Uh, she would sort of, uh, you know, exchange uh, uh, greetings with them uh, as she made her way to the defense table. Um, but while court was in session, she was very, uh, you know, she would pay attention, uh, but did not, you know, display any emotion, which again is, is just one of the interesting things about the case and her personality. You know, this murder, obviously it, it was part of a love triangle. It was, 
uh, a crime inspired by her heartbreak and, and sort of a loss of control uh, that she would have been so um, hurt by John's rejection of her that she would lash out in this way so over the top, so out of bounds um, and lose control of her emotions to 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 kill someone. Um, and contrasting that loss of control with sort of the the, the discipline and the, the lack of emotion that she displayed at the trial was um, striking and remains a mystery to me how someone can be capable of of losing it uh, and also you know keeping it together I mean the, the trial must have been very difficult for her emotionally just in terms of again everyone or most people have, have had their heart broken at, at one time or another through their life I mean imagine uh, reliving the worst breakup you ever had uh, publicly in front of all of your family members friends uh, I imagine some days of the trial were short and early, humiliating and painful for her, but she never uh, showed any emotion during any of those uh, um, moments, uh, even when it was detailing, you know, her extreme heartbreak back in the 1980s, um, even when it was John Rudden on the witness stand explaining um, again, in front of the jury, the public, strangers, Sherry's family, Stephanie's family, that, you know, he never loved her, that he never intended to, uh, to marry her. Um, you know, uh, things like that, you know, must have been painful for her to, for her to hear, but she didn't really show it on her face. Now, the, the, the current husband, now, did he divorce her then after she was convicted? Yes, after after her conviction, uh, uh, he filed for divorce. Yeah. And as, as far as I know, he 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 remains an LAPD officer. So again, this was like a very complicated, painful case uh, politically within the LAPD. Um, not only had Stephanie been an LAPD officer for a long time and had twenty some years worth of. Um, you know, professional and personal relationships she developed on the job, but uh, her husband was LAPD. Uh, they had not met and married until several years after the murder, so I certainly consider him a victim in this as well. Uh, again, you can imagine marrying someone in your in your 30s, and then you know this awful revelation that she had um, committed a murder. Um, before they even met, uh, you know, must have been um, very painful for him, for him to come to terms with. Mm. Now, did they have kids? Uh, yeah, they adopted a little girl in around 2006, so a few years before Stephanie was was uh, was arrested. Mm. I, I, I imagine that's really hard on on the family then, like that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine so. Um, again, one of one of my sources, one of the detectives who worked the case, uh, it's something that he said to me once that has sort of stayed with me the whole time. That you know, again, this this the the, the tragic event uh, uh, was back in 1986, but it, it reverberates over time, and and it's really mind-boggling to think about the the ripple effect and the number of lives that this has affected. Uh, you know, year after year after year, um, people who, again, weren't even, didn't even know Stephanie uh, back when the crime occurred, or like her daughter, weren't even alive when the crime occurred. But uh, what happened uh, and uh, the revelations about what happened, uh, you know, changed change the course of, of countless lives over time. Wow. Uh, so, how did you get a chance to talk to her parents or her mother or her family like that? Uh, no, uh, I I spoke to Stephanie's brother, uh, Stephen. Um, you know, which was interesting to hear a little bit more about uh, you know their their upbringing. Uh, but yeah, I mean, again, I I tried to I, I requested interviews from uh, you know pretty much everyone. 
uh, but could it force people to come to the table? So, uh, you know, the, the most significant characters in the story who I, I was not able to talk to were, I would say, probably Stephanie and John. Uh, but in both cases, you know, I was able to use other methods of reporting, uh, statements that they had given, um, or interviews with people who knew them uh, at the time and uh, tried to fill in as much of the story as I could. Uh, that way, even though I couldn't speak to um, them myself. Hmm. So what have you got planned next? After Now that you've finished this book, where do you plan on going? Well, I do have, I have an idea for, you know, there was a, there was a, one of the LAPD's cold case detectives, a, a guy named Rick Jackson, uh, who's a pretty, uh, remarkable person. Uh, uh, he, he, he's now retired, but had a fascinating career solving, uh, homicide cases for the LAPD. Uh, he, he, he solved the case back in the early nineties that, uh, he thought would always make a great book, but uh, he's not a writer. He asked me whether I'd be interested in uh, writing it with him, and I think that sounds pretty fun. So, um, you know, it'll probably be uh, a couple of years before that's out, but uh, you can stay tuned for another uh, um, true story of uh, LAPD, LAPD homicide detectives, uh, um, hopefully, hopefully not, not too long. Wow. Now, do you have a website or a place that people can reach you? Yes, I do. Uh, I have an author website, uh, which can be reached either by visiting MatthewMcGough.com, uh, or if it's easier to spell, you can just go to the LazarusFiles.com, files, plural, and that'll bring you both, both to the same place. And uh, I put quite a bit of information up there, background information, uh, other things that I've written uh, about the case, uh, interviews uh, like this one that we're recording right now, I'll, I'll probably post this uh, on the website when I get a recording. And uh, uh, yeah, there's quite a bit of info there for people who want to hear more, learn more about the case to uh, uh, poke around among. Great. Now, your book is available, of course, on Amazon and uh, I guess most bookstores, and it's and also yeah at, at, at yes I love uh, I love local independent bookstores so uh, yeah it, you, people can uh, can find it uh, locally uh, and also online. Fantastic! We'll have that on our website as well, so people listening can just do one click and pick up the book. Wow! Well, thank you very much. It's been a very interesting conversation. Uh, incredible book, uh, and you read the book as well, don't you? Like on the uh, the audio yeah that was an interesting experience i i I was asked to do that i I didn't know exactly what i was in for i mean the book is is uh is quite lengthy uh and it ended up i thought it was going to be a couple of days to uh to read (laughs) this thing for the audio book it ended up taking more than three weeks uh and it's i think something like 27 hours long so uh Yeah. yeah anybody who has a long commute or cross country drive or something like that uh, um, hopefully they'll they'll uh, check it out. Yeah, that's the way to go. I, I, that's the way I go now. That's all I do. Um, yeah, it, it was a good experience reading it. It was it was it was very interesting. Uh, um, um, so yeah, I'm I'm glad that that's out there and and in my own voice. Yeah, yeah, a lot of work. Well, it's been interesting. Thank you very much for taking the time to uh, be. Thank on the you show. so much, Alex. It was re- really a pleasure. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.